Hello, welcome to Postcolonial Space. I'm Masood Raja. And today I will conclude my discussion of the introduction to Edward Said's Orientalism. Now we've started this series in which I read and talk about the text with you. So I strongly recommend that before you watch this video or if you have accidentally chanced upon this video, please do watch the ones that come previously because this goes in a chronological order. In today's discussion, I will read third part of the part three of introduction. Now remember, in part three, Saeed is trying to explain three aspects of the existential reality within which he is thinking about the book and writing the book. In the first part that we discussed previously, he discusses the, di the distinction between pure and political knowledge and why it is problematic. The second part that I concluded in my previous video, he talks about and explains his methodology. What is the method he's following in this book and why? And this part, the part three, is what is termed the personal dimension. And this is where Said now incorporates his personal reasons as a Palestinian Arab Christian living and working in United States and what has that meant to him in creating this work. And just keep in mind this book came out in 1977 and at that time this is pretty rare in a scholarly book. I have colleagues who when they see my book, and if I started with an anecdote of, from my own life, they're like, oh, you talk about your own self, because there is this assumption that your own self should have nothing to do with literary scholarship. So that's pretty interesting. And some of the things that he says in this part are still pertinent and actually probably have intensified in the current global climate. So as always, I'll first read parts of the introduction and then come back and we can have a conversation with, about it. Now also keep in mind that I will try to record a concluding video in which I sum up what we have covered in uh, these discussions and that would be added as a separate video resource. As always, please read along, please read the book and then, you know, Pose your questions, bring your thoughts to this discussion so that we can benefit from each other. So here I go. I will start reading the beginning of part three, the personal dimension. The personal dimension. In the prison notebooks, Gramsci says, the starting point of critical elaboration is the consciousness of what one really is and is knowing thyself as a product of the historical process to date, which has deposited in you an infinity of traces without leaving an inventory." End of quote. The only available English translation inexplicably leaves Gramsci's comment at that, whereas in fact Gramsci's Italian text concludes by adding Therefore, it is imperative at the outset to compile such an inventory. <clears throat> Much of the personal investment in this study derives from my awareness of being an Oriental as a child growing up in two British colonies. All of my education in those colonies, Palestine and Egypt, and in the United States has been Western, and yet that deep early awareness has persisted. In many, many ways, my study of Orientalism has been an attempt to inventory the traces upon me, the Oriental subject of the culture whose domination has been so powerful a factor in the life of all Orientals. This is why, for me, the Islamic Orient has had to be the center of attention. Whether what I have achieved is the inventory prescribed by Gramsci is not for me to judge, although I have felt it important to be conscious of trying to produce one. Along the way, as sphere and as rationally as I've been able, I have tried to maintain a critical consciousness as well as 
employing those instrument of historical, humanistic, and cultural re research of which my education has made me the fortunate beneficiary. In none of that, however, I have ever lost hold of the cultural reality of the personal involvement in having been constituted as an Oriental. So there is a lot here to un unpack, especially for those of us who come from different parts of the Orient or the Muslim world and work in Metropolitan Academy or even live in it. And Saeed always goes back to this Gramsci quote, this quote that talks about the historical constitution of the self, right? But not knowing how that self came to be, how it was constituted, and then retroactively as a researcher, as a human person, to create an inventory of it. What would be an in inventory of a constituted Orientalist self, right? If you are seen as an Oriental, if you are seen as an Arab with so many different significations, is to go and look at the textual history of how it came to be. And that becomes kind of a cataloging, kind of an inventory creating. And so what's interesting for me in these passages is also Saeed acknowledging that even though he was born in the colonies and lived into his constituted self as intellectual is purely Western because that's where he studied, that's where he practices. Now one would assume that with such deep immersion within the metropolitan culture, certain things would happen, right? One would be that he would totally assimilate or will be accepted as an equal. And two, he wouldn't feel that he is an Oriental. But that doesn't happen even at that level at which Saeed was working in, even in 1978, right? He remains in his hearts of hearts, in his consciousness, a constituted Oriental, an Arab subject, right? And that's the inventory that he is taking into account, right? How does it come to be? that living in the 20th century America, having accomplished all that he had, right? How does he interact with the academy? But there is also a great hint here against all those who say you cannot use your master's tools to dismantle the house of the master. What he's saying is, I've been privileged enough to get this humanistic education to know how to write critically with a critical consciousness. Part of this book is me creating a catalog, an inventory of how I came to be, how this oriental subject came to be, right? But I'm doing it with the tools of Western Academy as dispassionately as I can with a critical consciousness, with humanistic critical tools. And so what we also learn from this, you know, which is, kind of a subtle point in this, these passages is that this disdain for learning the ways of metropolitan theory and all, yes, part of us will get incorporated in the process, but part of us also then gives us the tool to speak to power from within the vocabularies in which it practices itself, in which it unfolds itself, and dismantle its logic. Any look at Saeed's career as a scholar would convince anyone that you can be a highly intellectual, highly trained Western scholar of Oriental origins, but if you take it upon yourself to create a catalog of yourself, an inventory of the past that brought you to the point where you are a constituted Oriental subject despite your accomplishments, will also then end up altering the larger discourse of the metropolitan disciplines and academies as well. So this is the beginning of he explaining how this project is not necessarily just an intellectual project, not a disinterested pursuit, but there's a deep investment in him which is personal and which is driven from his experience of being an Arab, being a Palestinian, living and working in the United States. And that's a very important distinction to make. So let's read a little more. <clears throat>
and I'll come back and have some conversation about it. The historical circumstances making such a study possible are fairly complex, and I can only list them schematically here. Anyone resident in the West since the 1950s, particularly in the United States, will have, will have lived through the era of extraordinary turbulence in the relations of East and West. No one will have failed to note how East has always signified danger and threat during this period, even as it has meant the traditional Orient as well as Russia. In the universities, a growing establishment of area studies programs and institutes has made the scholarly study of the Orient a branch of national policy. Public affairs in this country include a healthy interest in the Orient, as much for its strategic and economic importance as for its traditional exoticism. If the world has become immediately accessible to a Western citizen living in the electronic age, the Orient too has drawn nearer to him and is now less a myth perhaps than a place crisscrossed by Western, especially American, interests. One aspect of the electronic postmodern world is that there has been a reinforcement of the stereotypes by which the Orient is viewed. Television, the films, and all the media's resources have forced information into more and more standardized molds. So far as the Orient is concerned, standardization and cultural stereotyping have intensified the hold of the 19th century academic and imaginative demonology of the mysterious Orient. This is nowhere more true than in the ways by which the Near East is grasped. Three things have contributed to making even the simplest perception of the Arabs and Islam into a highly politicized, almost raucous matter. One, the history of the popular anti-Arab and anti-Islamic prejudice in the West, which is immediately reflected in the history of Orientalism. Two, the struggle between the Arabs and Israeli Zionism and its effects upon American Jews as well as upon both the liberal culture and the population at large. Three, the almost total absence of any cultural position making it possible either to identify with or dispassionately to discuss the Arabs or Islam. Furthermore, it hardly needs saying that because the Middle East is now so identified with great power politics, oil economics, and the simple-minded dichotomy of freedom-loving democratic Israel, and evil, totalitarian, and terroristic Arabs, the chances of anything like a clear view of what one talks about in talking about the Near East are depressingly small. As you can see that after giving an account of his personal life and his investment as an Oriental or as an Arab subject in this study, Said now goes on to ground his study the Orientalism within the political matrix of his time. And uh, his reference to the electronic postmodern age is pretty instructive because we've come way beyond that. We're talking about 1978 here, so at that time there was no internet, but there was only print, TV, and film media. But even within that context, he's first suggesting that Orientalism and its tropes and its prejudices and stereotypes have been heightened because of the bipolar world, the Soviet Union and the Cold War and the United States, right? Because within that, the Arabs are kind of red along with this other menacing East. Then also on the part of the U.S. government, there was heavy investment in area studies. So people who study um, the Orient or the Muslim world or the Arab world no longer just study because they love the subject or that there is this lure of the exotic East. Increasingly, they are becoming Arabists or they are studying these regions because that knowledge is instrumental to U.S. foreign policy. So the new breed of Arabists and scholars who are coming up are already in service of U.S. foreign policy, and that's also another crucial thing to keep in mind. And that the 
American view of the Orient and the Islam then increasingly, both academically but also through popular culture, through films and media, is always mediated now through U.S. interests in the region. And U.S. interests include their interest in oil, right, their interest in the Arab Israeli relationships. So the three things that he lists, lists is first of all the existence of the historical prejudice about Islam and the two, the dichotomy between the Arabs and the Zionist Israeli government. Now keep in mind it's instructive that he's not using the term Palestinians because at that time in the 70s the conflict was still viewed as Arab-Israeli conflict. The Palestinians were a party to it, but they were not acknowledged as a separate entity. That happens much later. In fact, Said was the first Arab scholar to actually write a book called The Question of Palestine, where Palestinian identity as distinct from Arabs was the point that he argued. Now remember famously Golda Meir, the uh, Israeli Prime Minister famously declared that there were no Palestinian people because it suited Israeli policy to make it into an Israeli-Arab conflict. And then the dichotomy there is that in most of the progressive America, Israel is seen simplistically as this democratic, you know, citadel in the heart of this Arab tyranny and that stereotype plays a huge role in this. And then he is so true there, and it's still the case, that there is no true identification even on the American left at that time, but even now with the Palestinians. Of course, it, the instances of it are increasing. The young people are increasingly asking interesting questions. And there are Jewish organizations also asking these questions of Israel. Jewish Voice for Peace is one such organization which is multi-ethnic and multi-religious, and they ask the hard questions of the Israeli government. But by and large, when he's writing this book, there is no one actually who even is an Arabist and is promoting the cause of justice or is looking at the rights of Palestinian peoples. I mean, for most, so that simplistic dichotomy also plays a role in heightening of the stereotype about the Islamic world and about the Orient. Um, and then, you know, it's complicated by the politics of oil and U.S. oil and economic interests in the region. So throughout then the discourse of Orientalism, what he's suggesting then has, has reached a phase where it is now caught within world politics of the two powers fighting each other over their areas and zones of influence, further complicated by the Arab-Israeli conflict, and the stereotypes are augmented and accentuated because of the media, which represents the Arabs a certain way and Israelis a certain way with no nuance to it. So there is not increasingly any more room to develop some kind of positive view of the Arabs or Muslims, right? Now, please keep in mind that Said will go on to write a book called Covering Islam, in which he gives us clear instances of how the mythologies about the Muslim Orient are, are propagated, how they are used, created, and consumed by the American public. And sadly, you know, 35, 40 years after the book was published, uh, the situation is still the same. The only difference is that Palestinians are now acknowledged as a party to the conflict, though no one hears them out or takes their side. And most of the Arab regimes have now been incorporated within the gambit of American power, the Saudis, the United Arab Emirates. They, and in a way, uh, you can already see that in the process of normalizing their relationships with the United States or having the United States as a backer, they have abandoned the cause of Palestine even after post-Oslo Accords. And because of the rise of right-wing political parties in Israel, the possibilities of a peace, of a two-state solution are increasingly diminishing. Now do keep in mind that Saeed was for some time part of the Palestinian Liberation Organization Council after Oslo, uh, 
and eventually came to declare that that two state solution was lacked imagination and that the israelis and palestinians should be able to live together under one nation uh, so that where he stood towards the end of his life and he eventually resigns from the PLO Council. So this is kind of slight unpacking of the passages that we just read. He is plotting the contemporary stage of Orientalism within the geopolitics of U.S. interests in the region as mediated through media representations of Arabs, as represented through the mediated perspective of American interest in the region and beyond. So let's read a little more and then come back and talk about it. My own experiences of these matters are in part what made me write this book. The life of an Arab Palestinian in the West, particularly in America, is disheartening. There exists here an almost unanimous consensus that politically he does not exist, and when it is allowed that he does, it is either as a nuisance or as an oriental. The web of racism, cultural stereotypes, political imperialism, dehumanizing ideology holding in the Arab or the Muslim is very strong indeed. And it is this web which every Palestinian has come to feel as his uniquely punishing destiny. It has made, made matters worse for him to remark that no person academically involved with the Near East, no Orientalist that is, has ever in the United States culturally and politically identified himself wholeheartedly with the Arabs. Certainly there have been identifications on some level, but they have never taken an acceptable form as has liberal American identification with Zionism. And all too frequently, they have been radically flawed by their association either with discredited political and economic interests, oil company and State Department Arabis, for example, or with religion. The nexus of knowledge and power creating the Oriental and in a sense obliterating him as a human being is therefore not for me an exclusively academic matter. Yet, it is an intellectual matter of some very obvious importance. I've been able to put to use my humanistic and political concerns for the analysis and description of a very worldly matter, the rise, development, and consolidation of Orientalism. Too often liter literature and culture are presumed to be politically, even historically, innocent. It has regularly seemed otherwise to me, and certainly my study of Orientalism has convinced me, and I hope will convince my literary colleagues, that society and literary culture can only be understood and studied together. In addition, and by an almost inescapable logic, I have found myself writing the history of a strange secret sharer of Western anti-Semitism. That anti-Semitism and as I have discussed it in the Islamic branch, Orientalism resemble each other very closely is a historical, cultural, and political truth that needs only to be mentioned to an Arab Palestinian for its irony to be perfectly understood. But what I should like also to have contributed here is a better understanding of the way cultural domination has operated. If this stimulates a new kind of dealing with the Orient, indeed if it eliminates the Orient and Occident altogether, then we shall have advanced a little in the process of what Raymond Williams has called the unlearning of the inherent dominative mode. So here we are at the end of the introduction. He is now pulling us back to his own lived experience as an Arab and as a Palestinian which, according to him, at that time was not even possible because Palestinians were not acknowledged as separate from Arabs. And even if they were acknowledged, you know, they were on this margin of, of the society, American society, as undesirables. And that he also points to how the interest in the Middle East is inextricably, inextricably connected to power to the oil politics 
and if there are any Arabists, they've already pawned their expertise to the interest of United States or to the interests of oil companies and others. So what he's trying to highlight here is that there are no liberal or progressive voices who take a stance for Palestinians and their rights. And he's already explained that dichotomy of viewing Israel and Arabs differently. <clears throat> and then he is making this connection of Orientalism with the discourse of anti-Semitism, right? and how that was perpetuated, and how, according to that discourse, the Jewish citizens of the world and even the Jews in Israel were viewed a certain way in the European imagination. And what he's suggesting is that Orientalism as a discourse is not much different from that. But people are not making that connection. But if you read it carefully, the way the Palestinians and Arabs are demonized, especially the Palestinians, is pretty much the same discourse that was used by the anti-Semites. And then kind of a hopeful ending to the conclusion, and that is that if he has done his work, you know, if he has provided us that catalog, and if we read it, if people read it, maybe it would even obliterate the dichotomy of Occident and Orient. And if that happens, then he's saying maybe his job is done. So overall, you know, to sum up this section, but also the introduction, what we learn in the introduction from the very start is Said defining why is he writing this book. He defines what he means by Orientalism, different ways of looking at it. Then he goes on to explain what he had to keep in mind. That's what we have been discussing in the previous videos. You know, he had to first make a distinction that as a literary scholar, he can also talk about politics, that distinction between real knowledge and imaginative knowledge. Then he explains his methodology in which he goes into the details of why he is studying disparate genres, why is he excluding the Germans, how is he reading these texts, the interiority of the text and the exteriority of the text? And then in the, this last section, he explains the personal, personal dimension. What is his personal investment as a Palestinian Arab scholar in studying that subject and what the, his hopes and aspirations are? Now, on a side note, a lot of people who criticize Orientalism, especially the conservative scholars, they absolutely don't even read the introduction carefully enough. We cannot understand Orientalism without understanding what he is proposing to do in his introduction, which he pretty much follows through, or without keeping in mind Foucault's theory of discourse, how Said uses it and modifies it. Remember, he modifies it by suggesting that he believes in knowledge power nexus in the discourse that it produces, but he would also like to suggest that individual authors do leave an imprint on the works of others. That is something that Foucault would disagree with. But without reading this introduction carefully, and of course the book any opinion about Orientalism is then an opinion about what people make it to be and then opine about it, right? That's why I thought this reading exercise will help us get through at actually, you know, the plan of the project itself. I do hope to continue this. I don't know how long it would take to read the whole book, but we have now today concluded our reading of the introduction. I would love to hear your comments, your questions, anything that I missed. If you would like me to elaborate on that, please post it in the comments. I will also combine all these lectures in introduction probably into one video, which would be pretty long, and make it available so that if you want to watch it in one setting, you should be able to do that. This has been a wonderful journey so far. I hope it has been rewarding for you as well. Thank you so much. Stay safe. Take care of each other. And as always, peace and love.